Mic check. All right, thank you. So listen to this phrase, once upon a time. Now, as I say this phrase, maybe a couple of things have come to your head. Maybe you pictured those intricately woven fairy tales you read as a child. Maybe you saw a picture of the charming prince kissing the beautiful princess. Maybe you even saw a picture of that lukewarm 2011 TV series of the same name. But regardless of the specifics of what you're thinking about, everyone thought something along the lines of stories. From a young age, many of the lessons we learned were from the stories that we were told as children. We were taught ideals like love, courage, resilience, and sacrifice from those classic tales. We mimicked the characters that became the fixation of our childhood. Personally, to this day, without hearing of Aslan's death in the Chronicles of Narnia, I'd have a very different view of selflessness. And so I'm sure it doesn't take a lot more convincing for us to realize that through stories, we learn. As we grow older and enter formal education, we leave behind these stories and in their place pick up maybe a textbook, maybe a chart we begin to learn in a necessarily different way. Nonfiction learning is essential in developing our logical and analytical skills, thus furthering our holistic growth. Yet, as I dwelled on that progression of learning from childhood to early adulthood, I realized that, in a way, we leave behind a part of ourselves back there. See, those stories formed us. If only there was a way to retain storytelling and somehow merge it with our need to learn and better ourselves. That's when I learned about Humans of New York. To contextualize, Humans of New York was a project founded by Brandon Stanton in an attempt to give people a glimpse into the lives of total strangers. He interviewed random inhabitants of New York City and asked them to give a sort of insight into their lives. By observing the stories that Stanton documented, I was able to observe a strange phenomenon. When asked a single prompt, the interviewees, despite their various backgrounds, cultural, racial, socioeconomic, they are all unified in their common experience. And that was my eureka moment. This project was the missing link I was searching for. Stories, but from applicable, real experiences. And so, in an effort to further understand stories, uh, how personal stories connected and shaped individuals, I came up with my own version of this. I named it People of Penang. Um, the gist of it was to go around Penang and interview strangers about one specific prompt. I was privileged enough to conveniently be in a setting with pretty large ethnic diversity. See, this island, Penang, is unique in the sense that, although it's not very large, uh, its rich history as a port and trading city has enabled for this sort of modern blend of various cultures. With the accumulation of my intentions, as well as my ideal location, I hope to prove to others that people's stories could help us learn and bring us closer together. To start off the project, I formulated a thesis. This project could have gone a number of ways, but I chose to go with, though differences in people, both physical and cultural, do exist, all humans are connected through common experiences of difficulty in life, which can be expressed through stories. Let me break this down a little. I chose to focus on difficulty because I believe that it's a side of humanity that we tried to hide. We don't want other people to see it because, honestly, it hurts. Um, but deep down, we know that difficulty is the most defining part of ourselves. If I truly wanted genuine and authentic responses from people, I would have to dig deep to get it. And so I came up with a plan. I would visit four locations over four weekends. My goal was to reach eight people a week and come out with 32, and I did the math, wrong earlier, I wrote 38 here, but it's 32, individual stories depicting pain and suffering. For each of them, I would ask the question, what is the hardest experience you've had in life? And I would document their response on my phone note. I really thought this would be a relatively easy project. I mean, you see me standing here. I like to think that I'm not super intimidating, kind of approachable, not too sure about that. But um, anyway, here I am the day before my first excursion. <laughs> Wow, I was so youthful, <laughs> so blissfully ignorant. 
so full of hope. It seemed like debris. Just go in, ask them their deepest, darkest, most painful experience, and then just leave. What could go wrong? Yeah. I definitely wasn't expecting this. So I know you can read this infographic, but I'll unpack it a little. 12 hours of my life, 79 people I approached, 63 people rejected me, which leaves me with a 20% success rate. Definitely not betting odds. My initial goal of people I wanted to interview dwindled down at an actually pretty comedic rate from 32 to 28 to 24 to finally just half of my initial goal, 16. Honestly, nothing was really going my way. So what was it that made this experience so hard? First of all, like I hinted at earlier, getting people to talk to me, a complete stranger, was almost as hard as getting them to disclose their most traumatic life experiences. Second of all, I didn't realize, that, realize how hard it would be emotionally to get rejected consecutively so many times. I was rejected in very, very, very creative ways. At one point, someone, as I walked up to someone, so they pointed behind me. I looked, and they ran away. <laughs> it was so demoralizing. It took a lot of courage to go and talk to these people, but at the end of the day, I was just regarded with disdain. In retrospect, it seems really silly that I had the impression that as long as I just dressed well, I would be, people would be okay with me asking them random questions. So the learning curve was, as you would expect, very steep. Although I didn't come in with a plan, I quickly picked up how and how to not approach people. For example, and I really said this, you do not go up to someone and say, hi, my name is Joseph Chandra. Can I hear your life story? That's a no-go. I also learned that saying you are not selling something definitely makes it look like you are selling something. <laughs> Who knew? I learned that I couldn't just get to my main question. Conversations would take time. Once I initiated contact, I would have to start small. Maybe a, how are you today? And really let the conversation flow organically. I again emphasized that I was rejected many, many times. However, even if they decided to let me stay and talk to them, they were often caught off guard and didn't have an answer off the top of their head. Uh, as this kept occurring, I felt myself getting more and more frustrated. At some points, I really just felt like going home, crawling into bed, and crying in the fetal position. But something kept me going, the feeling of a good story. See, imagine you apply to 79 colleges, which I believe some people in this room would do. Among those 79 colleges, you only get accepted to 16 of them. But from those 16 colleges, those were the ones you just really, really wanted to get into. Um, so you wouldn't care that you got rejected by those 63 people, I mean colleges, right? Um, yeah, well, that's a pretty bad analogy, but you get the point. Those 16 stories held perhaps the most heart-wrenching, thought-provoking, genuine conversations I've ever had. I heard stories of failed abortions, mental illnesses, alcoholism, and even death. I met people of all different races, religions, economic statuses, and cultures, all of whom shared that common experience of going through deep difficulty. <sighs> However, it wasn't their stories alone that influenced my understanding of human nature. The conversations that I had with these people also deeply affected me. See, most of the time, we try to repress and bottle up bad memories. We put up the impression of happiness because we don't want other people to know that we're suffering, but we can't keep it in for too long. If we don't console the past, it'll tarnish the present. Or as a speaker recently once said, hurt people, hurt people. As I spoke with many of these hurting and broken people, I observed the beauty of release through our conversation. I consoled and I affirmed their pain but I allowed them to share and let it go. This was when I began to learn that, unlike my initial thesis, it wasn't just our shared or common experiences that brought us together, but also our shared experiences, the ones that we confide in with other people. I was so honored and blessed to walk this journey of healing with the people I interviewed.
But none of this would have been possible if it weren't for the vulnerability and trust these people showed in me. It takes a lot to talk to a stranger, much less share your most vulnerable moments. At one point in the project, after I asked someone the question, unexpectedly, they asked me the same one. They said, so Joseph, what's your most difficult moment? And to my surprise, I didn't have one. Um, and so I realized how hypocritical I was. Throughout the whole project, I expected people to talk to me, a stranger, when I wouldn't have. I expected people to have an answer, despite not having one myself. I expected people to share when I wouldn't have either. And so to end, I'd like to share one of my most difficult moments in front of this audience. This experience is something I've never had the courage to speak about, even with those closest to me. So here it is. I lived, in, I lived here in Penang until the end of seventh grade. After that year, my parents had to explain to me that we were moving to the US to help my brother adjust to college. This also meant that I would be placed in the American public school system. Um, for those who didn't know, the American public school system is usually split into three separate age groups. There is the elementary schools, the junior high or middle schools, and finally the high schools. Among those, uh, also, public schools are split into zones in which the location of your residence determined which schools you could attend. Um, to unpack that a little, basically what that meant is if you lived in the same location as a child, you would be with your peers all throughout your schooling experience. Um, that also meant as I went into my eighth grade year, which was the last year of junior high, um, I would be friendless. Uh, it was a hard year, no doubt, but probably the most memorable thing about that year was one specific moment. It was near the beginning of the school year. I was sitting by myself at recess just watching the other kids do their thing. This was a common occurrence because I was pretty socially awkward and shy. Then this kid comes up to me. He said, hi, my name's Isaac. What are you doing? I told him I was just sitting and watching the other kids like usual. He told me, and I'll always remember this, no one should be alone. He then helped me up and invited me to join him and his group. Turns out he had just moved as well, but instead of feeling sorry for himself like I did, he actually went out and tried to make friends. Uh, here he is on the far left. Because of him, I was able to make friends and not be alone my whole eighth grade year. Because of him, I got over my social awkwardness and learned to talk to people. Then high school came around. High school was a new start to me. See, our high school was composed of the graduates of three different middle schools. This meant, like everyone else, I was new. I was able to meet so many new people and create genuine friendships. I started drifting away from Isaac and this group of people um, up here. We were still on good terms, but it's just we weren't as tight anymore. I was having an amazing time, and that year and a half before moving back to Penang was probably one of the most memorable experiences of my life. I didn't see Isaac much anymore, but I assumed he was doing as well as I was. He wasn't. Isaac was struggling a lot, and no one was catching on that this typically smiley boy was breaking on the inside. On April 11th, 2017, Isaac Oscar Pedley tragically took his own life, alone. I still think back on the day that he picked me up from the ground and said, no one should ever be alone. I grieved that I wasn't there for him and that I didn't see earlier that just because someone smiles, it doesn't mean that they're happy. I mourned because I wasn't there for him when he was always there for me. And sometimes I imagine how different my life would be without his one act of courage to talk to me, that weird, socially awkward kid from Malaysia. Maybe I could have done something. Maybe I couldn't have. But all I know is some nights, I lay awake, sleepless, thinking about what would have happened if he had someone to share with. Someone to be vulnerable with. Someone who cared because it sure as hell wasn't me. I know he's watching over me now. So Isaac, I just want to tell you, I'm sorry, man. I'm sorry that I wasn't there for you, and I'm sorry that you had to go alone. That's not what you wanted, and I miss you. If the people that I interviewed had the courage to share their most painful experiences with a complete stranger, how much easier is it for you to confide in a friend? If I can share my story, Isaac's story, 
with an audience of 100 plus people, how much easier is it for you to tell just one? Vulnerability is the key to healing. We can go our whole lives internalizing our struggles, painting the picture that everything is perfect, but for how long can we put up this facade? For some of us, we've done it our whole lives. We fear that if we stop pretending to be someone, if we become vulnerable and open, we'll be looked down upon by our peers. But there is hope. Going back to my project, as I started talking to more people, I added on the question. If you could go back in time with the knowledge that you do now, and change those negative experiences, would you? Nearly every single one of them said no. See, they've realized that without those downs in life, they would never experience or appreciate the growth facilitated through these difficult experiences. As you look back on your most difficult moments, moments of pain, anger, suffering, and guilt, think to yourself, who would I be without those moments in my life? So, what is the moral of the story? I think that's up for you to figure out yourself, but I want you to remember this. Your struggles, past or present, define who you are today. So here's my challenge for you, the audience. Go out and find someone, just one person you can talk to, because there are people out there who care. Because no matter how big or how small, you all have an idea worth spreading, and even more, a story worth telling. Thank you for coming and listening to the TED Talks.